We made this. Hello all and welcome to another edition of Pick a Disc. I'm your host Matt Latham and this is the podcast where someone picks a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And today I'm joined by Sarah Fagin, Name Three Songs podcast, to talk about the soundtrack to the film Josie and the Pussycat Dolls from 2001. And it's uh, got another couple of firsts for the podcast. Well, this is the first fictional band that I think we've covered. Uh, Yes, fictional band. Um, it's not the first movie soundtrack, but it's, it's weird. We've got also first fake boy bands. We've got two different fictional bands talked about on the episode today. You know what? The best way to find out what we talk about, you know, is just to, you know, just, you know, carry on listening after I've stopped talking. But before I stop talking and I start talking again, but with a thing I recorded in the past... Follow us on the social media, so if you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, you don't get anything special apart from just my lovely witticisms and self-deprecating humour. Um, we're also on Discord, so there's a picky Discord that you can join. And just say hello and tell us what you're listening to, and say hi. Um, other than that, I can't think of anything else to talk about, so the best thing to do is to sit back and talk to Sarah. So it's time for another, this bit doesn't really make sense because it's an audio medium, but the background of uh, the guest in the webcam. So um, Sarah, Sarah Fagan from the uh, Name Three Songs is my guest. And um, in the background is, if I could guess what would be in the background of your webcam, it would be a massive picture of Harry Styles. And, yes, it is. <laughs> and the subject of what we're recording. Um, I'm not going to reveal it just yet, but... I'm going to assume that's always been there. So I've been... Yes, it's always there. It so it's not. So it's there. not specially. It's not specially <laughs> no, set up. Just for... always here. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure like, if I could have made a guess, of what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, which um, which bodes which bodes well for the conversation we're going to have because it ties in very neatly to well, uh, well, we'll talk. We'll, I mean, once you introduce the album, we'll talk about what's behind you in a second. But um, yeah, <laughs> you know what, Sarah, why don't you just. Tell the lovely listeners the disc that you've picked for today. Uh, Yeah, I've picked the soundtrack for the iconic 2001 film, Josie and the Pussycats, um, because the album was specifically created to create the band of Josie and the Pussycats. So while it is an imaginary band, everything was specifically written for this movie, for this band, and exists in and of itself. So I feel like it counts as a a real band, and I will always stand on that hill. Yeah, Yeah, and I think as uh, I'm saying behind you, you've got, I think, the movie poster framed. Yes, I do. And is that that actually, are those the characters in smaller... frame? Is that in the frame as well? Because it looks like you've got the... Yeah, so they're holding... So it's them, like, in, like... In the limo, like holding the album, like in oh, okay. their hands. So it was like one of a couple of like movie posters that existed <clears throat> for the film. Yeah. So um, yeah, part of me was like not quite uh, not surprised that it's in the background anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah. So Josie and the Pussycats, uh, two thousand and one. Yeah, Josie and the Pussycats. It's the soundtrack to the film of the same name, released in two thousand and one, which is a according to Wikipedia, a musical comedy film co-produced by Universal Pictures and Metro Goldwyn Mayer, written, directed and co-written by Harry Alphonse and Deborah Kaplan. And the film is loosely based on the Archie comic series and the Hanna Barbera cartoon of the same name. So yeah, features uh, Rachel Lee Cook, Tara Reid, and Rosario Dawson as the Pussycats with Alan Cumming, Parker Posey, Gabriel Mann, uh, Paulo Constanzo, and Missy Paul in supporting roles. And uh, we'll go into a bit more about its reception and stuff as we, uh, as we later on. But yeah, so it's based on that film. So, Sarah, why have you picked Joseph <laughs> the Pussycat? <laughs> well, I mean, if any of the people listening today have listened to our podcast, I feel like this this film is. <laughs> I've forced my co-host Jenna to talk about this podcast. We've gone on other podcasts. I mean, I forced my co-host Jenna to talk about this movie. Um, we've gone on other podcasts to talk about this movie. Um, this this film truly shaped my whole life. Um, my mom took us. So the movie was very much uh, promoted as a kid's film when it very much was not a kid's film. And so my mom was like, oh, it's PG-13. So they can like say the one like F word that like PG-13 films are allowed to say. And obviously she was deciding between like covering my sister's ears or eyes like periodically throughout this film. I think I was like 
nine when we went to yeah i was yeah i was nine when it came out and um <laughs> we saw the film when we were on vacation and it truly just like changed my like a, a projective of life um i saw it and was like mom i need to take drum lessons now um <laughs> like that was what i got out of it was that i wanted to be melody which is funny because melody was played by tara reed um <laughs> which subsequently on in her career is a bit of a questionable person to like, <laughs> for a nine-year-old me to attach to um but i was like no she's so cool this is what i want out of life and then as i've grown as a music fan and a music journalist I've really realized that this movie was way ahead of its time and very much like encapsulates like all of the issues that we talk about the music industry on Name Three Songs in that like women are expected to be certain things. They're going to be pitted against each other. The music industry likes to control them, all this fun stuff. Um, And there's just like so much imagery in the movie and in the soundtrack in and of itself that is so specific to like my music taste and all those things. And I feel like anybody who watches the movie now will be shocked to find out that it was filmed in 2001 just because of the themes, which like at that time felt so I'm assuming because I was a child, but I mean like having talked to like other Josie and the Pussycats fans and stuff who are older, like the film at the time was very much like, Oh, they're talking about stuff that might get them in trouble. (laughs) Yeah. So, so it's pretty much, like one of like the foundations of you as a per as a person yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <truly. laughs> yeah so basically yeah so it's like there's always been like a an idea that you got your personal rep met rushmore of things where you got like f- where you have like four pillars and stuff i think this i went onto a, a disney podcast years ago and they asked me to make my top four met rushmore disney characters mm-hmm. or whatever. so the the met rushmore of sarah fagin one of them would be this film it's like repla- replacing i don't know Who's on Met Rushmore? Lincoln or something? <laughs> yeah. So really? it's like one. Yeah. So it's one of your foundational kind of moments. Yeah. yeah definitely. Oh, for okay. sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, yeah. Listening to yeah. Listening to your podcast and um, you've mentioned it gets brought up very regularly. <laughs> yeah. 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 But then again, then again, the what um, this film actually, the film and the soundtrack actually um, seems to appear quite a few times. I think in the last few months, quite mm-hmm. a few of podcast i listen to um have have like brought it up i think uh yourselves it's been on um um into a podcast called sidetrack with abby and john they talked about it a few weeks ago um and i think uh soundtrack your life hosted by ryan who came on to talk about the streets uh, a few episodes ago um spoke about the album as well yeah it's one of those it's, it's one of those films that seems to be it's there then suddenly kind of picks up yeah where everyone soon remembers it and yeah, but um, in terms of my kind of, uh, I'll, I'll get my disclosure out of the way so we can get this bit. Um, I only w- w- first watched the film a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't believe it took you so long. <laughs> yeah, and I'll get I'll get to why as well because this, <laughs> this threw me because um, Harry Alphonse and Deborah Kaplan. Um, this is their last film they co-written and directed. Mm-hmm. They had only worked on one of the film. Um, can't hardly wait which is one of my favorite films of all time i've talked about top tier albums where like i've got favorite albums but then top tier are kind of the creme de the creme favorite mm-hmm. guns ahead i'll pick one of them um yeah i've got four like i've got four films that are like kind of top tier films um can't hardly wait is one of them to this day it is probably the only film i know of that i've watched twice in succession one as soon as it finished through the tape yeah, and that was also in that. That's because I borrowed the ta- the film off a friend, and I pretty much watched it mm-hmm. every single day for a week before I gave it back to him. <laughs> and on one of those days, I watched it twice. Um, and it's the only film that I've ever done that with. And um, yeah, I love that film um, to bits. Um, I can pretty much quote it backwards. Um, and so not so not watching their other film, um, I was like, why have I never watched it? Um, I think by the time it came out, two thousand and one. I think at that point. I was what? When was it came out in the UK? It was around... So yeah, I was 15, 16. I think at that point... Yeah, at that point, <coughs> I'd listened to Eminem's Marshall Mathers and pretty much, yeah, I'd gone down the, the rap rabbit hole. So I was pretty much listening to rap music at that point. Well, which... the, pro- the promotion for the film like didn't help because the promotion for the film was like... And this was the whole issue with the film in general of why 
I mean, I'm sure we'll get to this more, but like the the film itself bomb was like box office bomb. Um, whereas the soundtrack was, was certified gold, sold over 500,000 copies. So like it's it's a very interesting thing where it became like a cult classic film, but it was really promoted. And if you look at the trailers or any of the posters for the film or anything like that that was used to promote it, it was very much like, oh, this is for eight year olds because of like the Archie Comics connection and like the cartoon connection and like that idea. And it's just one of those things where like clearly the people that were hired to do the promotion for it just did not talk to Harry and Deb about it at all. They had no, cause like, uh, it's so crazy how much of like a cult following and like a community is formed around this film and the soundtrack because like the, the creative people behind it are so passionate about it still to this day. And it's like 21 years old as a movie. And it's like, and that's really incredible, but also just so crazy because I feel like that doesn't happen very much for films that don't do very well. Yeah, I think it's kind of. Oh wait, I I really can't I can't remember it if it had any impact or whatever in the in the UK. The only time I can remember hearing about it or thinking about it is if it showed up on one of the mo- Sky Movie channels. Yeah, in, in the evening or something. And but what's quite but what I found quite interesting is that I kind of like. If I end up watching a film, I'll just take a picture of it saying, I'm watching this and put it onto an Instagram story. I have never had as many replies to an Instagram story <laughs> as I ever had as when I said I was watching this. And it was a picture of, like, the and stuff. And I had, I had a couple of friends I had a couple of friends of mine who were basically based in the UK. I had an American friend, um, Meg, who came on to talk about uh, Panic! at the Disco and um, Love Actually uh, reply saying, oh, I love this film. Um, because because like, I was randomly talking about Can't Hardly Wait as well, actually, like a few weeks before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was like kind of weird, just like a bunch of these like people just coming to it, and to the point where I had my uh, I had two of my friends who are sisters independently talking <laughs> to me on Instagram about this film. Some of my friends, Lou and Lucy, basically talking to me um, about. Oh, I was, oh, I loved this film watching growing up, and <laughs> not realizing mm-hmm. they were both talking to me at the time. Yeah, if they, if they listen to this, hello. I didn't tell them that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I just find it kind of yeah, I just kind of find it weird how much of a cult following it's gone had since. But then I've known people who I've known people who apparently have watched it for for years when it came out and mm-hmm. like, twenty years ago. And I, I just find it quite in. I think it's quite quite interesting how it's managed to get that kind of cultural foothold. But um, if you just take a step back and second, just talk about the actual concept of Josie and the Pussycats. So Josie and the Pussycats um, is an adaptation of comic book characters. And a cartoon based on cartoon characters. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hopefully ask you to kind of fill in the gaps gaps on this. But my understanding is that Joseph and the Pussycats are part of a kind of series of comics um, by Archie, based on the named after the character of Archie. Who listeners in the UK probably listeners in the UK probably uh, I'm gonna get told there that I'm gonna get told there that I'm talking rubbish and that it's not just Riverdale, but the characters in Riverdale <laughs> are based on. Like yeah, the RG comics. comics. Yeah, which are from the sixties, yeah. correct? Yeah, it was like from what I know, because like I wasn't like an Archie comics fan or anything. Um, really growing up, like I watched the cartoon after becoming aware of, like after watching the movie because it was on Cartoon Network quite a lot. Um, but the Archie comics were published from I think like the sixties to the eighties, and then kind of had a revival in the twenty tens. I want to say. Um, and I've read they have like all different factions of the Archie comics where there's like there's like dark Archie there's like all this stuff I've read like the Archie comics that I read are very much like um, about like werewolves and zombies and stuff which is fun Um, but I mean like Sabrina the Teenage Witch is also from the Archie universe so um, Josie was first introduced like in the Archie comics and then the fans of Archie comics were like, we love this character. This is awesome. So then Josie and her band, the Pussycats, like they got their own comic book series and then television show. And it was all cartoon based. Um, And yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite fun because it was, that was very much like a kid's thing. And again, that's why I stated earlier, like the film was probably promoted to kids because like a lot of film companies outsource the trailers to other people. And they probably had no background about the film. Um, so it is interesting kind of using the idea of Josie and the Pussycats to like create the film that they did create, which is very much like, you know, just like outing the music industry for the trash. It's for the trash it is. 
yeah, um, I think we'll get into that a bit more in a second. But I think what's quite what I find quite interesting with with this is that I think Jazz and the Pussycat, the cartoon series, which I think this is kind of based on, or has like mm-hmm. elements of. So it's um, a Hanna Barbera production from yeah the early seventies, and I think one of the characters is voiced by. Well, I've just seen Casey Kasem's name, who uh, well knows the voice of Shaggy, and yeah, um, yeah, and it's kind of like a. I I saw the I ended up watching the car, the introduction um because the the song's covered in the mm-hmm. um and it feels so much like a uh it's a Scooby Doo kind of knock off rip off yeah yeah I think that they kind of also existed in the same universe because I want to say that they're that Josie and them appeared in some Scooby Doo episodes throughout time but like I don't quote me on that but that feels right in my soul. <laughs> Like it feels like that happened. Yeah, um, well, I just found that quite, quite interesting. But so, but there's kind of like a lineage, like a lineage behind the characters. Mm-hmm. So the music from the mo- music from the motion picture Josie and the Pussycats, which is the full title of the album, which is quite, a, which is a uh, quite of a mouthful, um, is the soundtrack album to the 2001 film of the same name. Um, it was released in March 27th, 2001 by Playtone in conjunction with Epic, Riverdale Records and Sony Music Soundtracks. So I'm assuming Riverdale Records is just <laughs> is based on the Riverdale, the yeah. Archie. Yeah. Yeah, it's the town that Archie lives in in the comics as well as the nonsense TV show on Netflix. <laughs> the album, from, from what I read from the album, the album was kind of, there were songs written for the film. Mm-hmm. And from what I was reading, they... Wanted to release a soundtrack, but they got a collection of singer song like songwriters to work on a few more songs, to mm-hmm. and a couple of covers to like flesh out the album stuff. And the um, it's quite, and the people that work on it it's quite quite a decent um, like list of producers that are involved. Oh yeah, no, yeah. this is this is my favorite thing about the soundtrack is that the two main producers of this album are Babyface and Adam Schlesinger, who's from Fountains of Wayne, um, <laughs> which is incredible, along with Dave Gibbs, who I don't actually know who that is. Um, he was apparently in a Boston-based power pop band called Gigolo Ants, which is the best name I've ever heard of. But I just pulled that up on. Love that. But I knew about Babyface and Adam Schlesinger because... Of course I did, but also my favorite thing that just like combines things that Sarah that I love <laughs> just combine things that I love the like Sarah Fagan list of uh, personality traits is that Pete once from Fall Out Boy heard this soundtrack and then on their album hold on I need to pull up which album this is yeah for Infinity on High which was their album that came out in two thousand and seven they decided to have some of their songs produced by Babyface because when they heard the Josie and the Pussycat soundtrack, he was like, I love that this is pop punk that sounds like it was produced by somebody who never heard pop punk in their life. And he was like, I want that for me. Um, So they got Babyface to produce like two or three songs on Infinity on High. And I'm like, wow, everything about me combined into one. Incredible. Yeah, I think um, Adam Schlesinger, um, I've talked about in the past on the podcast because we covered uh, Fountains of Wayne. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, a song, like a songwriter who sadly uh, no longer with us. I think he, yeah. he passed away. I think because of COVID um, complications. Twenty twenty. Um, very very good songwriter who was somehow able to create really catchy songs on a whim. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and as I said, as I said before, and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole because I, because I love the show. Um, he's also like instrumental in uh, Crazy Ex Girlfriend. Yes, I was literally yeah. about to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and at one at one at one point, I will do a pick a disc on Crazy Ex Girlfriend because you I should. want to talk about the song. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, yeah, but um, so baby baby face, I'm pretty sure it was a name that I'm rang a bell, but I don't really know much about him. And I was just looking through. I don't think he's come up on the um, podcast before, and then, but I, this is when I suddenly realised he did the Usher Confessions album. But <laughs> um, he's. Wikipedia um, intro has said he's written and produced over 20, what, 26 number one R&B hits throughout his career. So yeah. a bit of clout behind it. <laughs> a bit of clout behind yeah. it. But a very interesting um, very interesting choice to help produce uh, the whole, like, the, whole uh, the album, more exactly produce the album. Um, yeah, I mean, so. I think it's just like respect for 
the the themes of the film and the people doing it and like the passion behind it because I mean everybody who was working on it it really was like a group effort like I feel like a lot of people will say like oh the film like our film production they like we were all family but like really when you read anything that's gone into this movie like there is an oral history book that just came out there's a podcast that's I think based out of Australia that's like talk to the people who've been involved like even if you get the vinyl there's like a story Q and a that comes in like the album packet for it. So, I mean, they're all very passionate about this film. So I feel like people in the industry, like really respected that. Contributors included, um, Kai Hanley, who's a singer for Let's Clear, who do actually, he's actually the voice for Josie. Yeah. Um, but other contributors include Beef Naked, who I, who I only know through the Buffy soundtrack. Uh, again, before mentioned, Adam Schlesinger, Dave Gibbs, uh, Jason Faulkner, Matthew Swee, Jan Wilden of the Go-Go's, Adam Juritz, um, I had to do a double take when I saw his name. Uh, I was like, really? Okay. Uh, Anna Waronka, if I got that, pronounced that right, um, whose name is coming, whose name seems to have come up so much in stuff I've listened to over the last few weeks, over the last few months, um, that I still need to listen to that dog properly. Um, yeah, and yeah, so there's quite a lot of like talent throughout throughout this, and I think also um, um, Kaplan and Alphonse also have a lot of writing credits for some of the yeah. songs as well. So um, yeah, so I th- what I quite, quite what a quick question I'm gonna quickly ask as well. Um, the album it's. The album itself, it's pretty much, you can kind of, well, the track listing on Wikipedia and on Spotify mm-hmm. uh, lists, I think, 13 songs on this. But then you mentioned something before we started recording that I found quite interesting. The The album is pretty much, you can kind of split it into like three ways. You've got the original songs, you've got some covers, and mm-hmm. you've got um, two songs from the boy and band. And you have du jour. Du jour. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, and you've got, so you've got the album with you. Is that the vinyl you've got? Yeah, I've got my I've got my vinyl with me because I couldn't so is find, that <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't find my normal CD. So which so uh, what songs on there? Is it just the Josie songs that are on? Yeah, so side A and side B are just Josie, and then you have the bonus single of the two du jour songs, which is just I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> like it's such good marketing, I think. <laughs> yeah, the um. Yeah, I think on the soundtrack, on this listening soundtrack itself, um, I think Du Jour, Around the World and Back to Lover is just before the Josie and the Pussycats theme song cover. Theme song cover. So um, I think, so I think kind of find, quite like, I quite like the fact that they've, for the physical stuff, they've kept it as a quote-unquote Josie and the Pussycats album. Yeah. Not put the Du Jour songs on there to not break up the flow and stuff, even though it is quite funny to listen to them when you're listening through. But we'll get to those songs in a second. Um, I think before we could be talk about the song, before we talk about the song itself, mm-hmm. the actual film. I I quite I actually found myself quite liking the film. Um, watching it, going, <laughs> I should listen. Watch this at least twenty years ago. Yeah, but um, <laughs> yeah, the film the, the film is pretty much um, basically uh, Jealousy, Valerie, and Melody just like suddenly getting um, picked up by Adam Cummings, kind of A and R man, um, right, who works for. I don't know the character's name, but Parker Posey's character, who basically runs a record company, who he's secretly putting in subliminal messaging to, um, yeah, to get people to buy stuff like, uh, like yeah, like corporate stuff and everything. Um, basically, so like actually putting in hidden messages <laughs> into films, which um, it, it, hidden messages into songs, and like takes Joe's and the Pussycats. And basically uses them to try and sell stuff. Take over and, the world. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, yeah, and in 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 the, in the middle of that, you've got a bunch of so- a bunch of songs. You've got a bunch of uh, teenagers who are suddenly buying all sorts of stuff. A nice ongoing joke where it says "so and so is the new so and so," which I thought was which I thought was quite yeah. nice. Repeating uh, things and um, um, an actor who I only know was Nolan from Revenge, being one of the most blandest. Uh, love interest in any film whatsoever. Oh my god, I forgot he was in Revenge. <laughs> that makes it so much funnier. That's I, that, I only know I only, I only know him from that. I thought that was, and he suddenly appeared in this. So I was like, oh look, it's oh look, he, man, he Alan had, he, M. 
yes. best love interest ever. This <laughs> movie, this movie passes the Bechdel test in like so many ways that it's <laughs> ridiculous. Oh, I love, I just, I love a himbo love interest because that's literally what he is. Like he's so fucking stupid. And <laughs> it's just iconic. Yeah, it's like basically you. Yeah, I think you can just take, basically take him out of the film and it wouldn't change a bit. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of stuff on kind of like commercialism and it's like quote unquote selling out and yeah like corporate advertising and stuff. Anyone who's watched Wayne's World, there's a nice, there's a scene where they take the piss out of corporate sponsorship where Wayne and Garth is like saying, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this. And they're wearing stuff like Reebok or eating, pe- eating Pizza Hut and stuff and putting all the corporate, all the uh, sponsorship in there. Um what I quite like is that in pretty much on e- almost every scene, there's like logos oh, yeah. in the background, which um, yeah, yeah, which wasn't actually paid for sponsored. They just put them in anyway, so it's not product placement. It was just yeah, it's just the play on the fact of like consumerism of America. Like this is so f- like it's when you start talking about it, you're like, oh wow, this is like a really intricate like <laughs> <laughs> like very deep meaningful <laughs> film when you really think about it because it's really just like. <laughs> It's this like silly little comic book movie, like you said, where they are like pulling things from the comics, which again, like I've watched this film with people who've never seen it before or like don't really know much about like Archie comics or the Hanna-Barbera cartoon or anything like that. And so there'll be like these little jokes about like um, like there's even one point where um, Alex and Andrew Cabot. So like the the sister of their manager, they're like, why are you even here? And she's like, because I was in the comics. And it's just like so funny because there's so much deeper stuff going on. And like there's all this commentary on like consumerism and like how and and there's like that comment by um Alan Cummings character when they're like in Times Square and there's like the big poster of them and like their name originally was just the Pussycats and they changed it like the record label changed it to Josie and the Pussycats and they're like why did you do that and he's like oh because it's like statistically proven that bands with and in the name sell better and they're like but what about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones and he's like oh just <laughs> don't ask questions we know what we're doing <laughs> Yeah, I think he mentions something like we could probably sell a cart, sell a Saturday morning TV show on it as well, or something like that. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, yeah, there's that. Um, there's that. Oh, there's another bit. Yeah, I think. Oh, um, the product placement. The bit that got me was like there's a kind of almost a romantic scene between I think Josie and Alan M in this like mm-hmm. Shark Tank, and yeah. the world's most weirdly placed Evian logo. Stuck yeah, 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 on the yeah. thing. Yeah, it's just so out of place. It just yeah, yeah. It's it, it's like one of the most. It's just hilariously just out of place. It's just on its own. Whereas like another one, you've got like the Target logo. I think yeah, the Target the logo is everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just <laughs> ridiculous how much um that is as well. Um, and back to the, the album second. One thing I was going to bring up. I should have brought up earlier. I think. What I found quite interesting when you're talking about the foundational kind of sound or how this kind of like influenced, I think, yourself and perhaps a couple of other artists, um, a lot of stuff that I think I know, that I think what this, a lot of stuff that I'm kind of like into in terms of listening to music and stuff sounds so much like is influenced from this. So mm-hmm. stuff like Charlie Bliss or kind yeah. of like. I think, I feel like there was actually something, um, the, oh, hold on, let me grab my book, but one second. The, the oral history of Josie and the Pussycat, <laughs> <laughs> which I am, I'm quoted in, so that's fun. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I just want to make like be a hundred percent sure about this, but I'm pretty sure that the singer of Charlie Bliss is actually quoted quite heavily in this book, um, for. This the soundtrack being like a really big, um, what should we call it? Inspiration for her. The um, uh, oh, is it shopping for a camper van? I think that might be the name, but I can't remember if that's the exact name. The word camper van's in it. Um, tribute album on camp band camp for Adam Schlesinger. Uh, Charlie Bliss do a co- Charlie Bliss do a cover of Pretend to Be Nice. Okay, yeah, so yeah, it is her. Um, so yeah, so there's like I don't know if you know who Sadie du- uh Dupis is. Uh, yes. yeah, so like she was really inspired by Josie. She tweets about um the movie and the soundtrack quite a lot. She's also in this book. Um, yeah, so it's it's quite fun because like there's these people who 
you wouldn't really expect to be so uh, inspired by a silly little movie from 2001. But they are, and I love it. So you say you so you're quoted in that book as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> Like, literally, like, Rosario Dawson's in here, and I'm like, oh, there's some quotes from me. <laughs> How crazy. So, for the benefit of the type, what book is it? It's the... It's called Best Movie Ever, An Oral History of Deborah Kaplan and Harry Elephant's Josie and the Pussycats. Um, and it's by Russ Burlingame, and it came out, like, this past year. It was, like, a... Uh, whatchamacallit? There was, like, a... Not a GoFundMe, the other one. Takes that. Um... Yeah, there was like a Kickstarter, I think, for it. And so I think you can still buy it like through Russ on Twitter. But it's quite fun because like there's like a movie ticket. <laughs> like a concert <laughs> ticket. That came with it. it was just like so great because he like talked to Harry and Deb and like Kay um, and Rachel Lee Cook who played Josie and like basically and like also um, what is his name? Brett. Sorry. Like the guy who's like in all those 90s movies. Who is in Dujour? Uh, Brecken Meyer. Brecken Meyer, who is in, who was in Clueless and like all these other '90s movies. Like he loves the fact that he was in 15 minutes of Josie and the Pussycats <laughs> as one of the members of Dujour. Like he's obsessed with it, and I love it so much. I quite love the fact that so you're, that your kind of obsession with this film has now kind of been documented on. Oh onto, yeah, and on, onto an oral history <laughs> alongside the cast and the crew. <laughs> oh yeah, I was like, this is the best thing ever. He, yeah, it was really cool because when we when we made our name three songs episode about the podcast, I like tweeted about it, and Harry and Deb both liked the tweet, and I was like, Harry, I triple dog dare you to listen to this podcast episode because your movie changed my life, and he was like, I'll get to it, and then he did, and he like gave us a nice like compliment on Twitter, and I was like, wow. <laughs> When I move into my own apartment again, I'm going to print this out and frame it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I know that they are quite active because I know they, they talk about this and I think I can't hardly wait a bit as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just too scared to come in and say, I love that film. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I have no shame over how much I love <laughs> Josie and the Pussycat. But, um, yeah, so uh, let's, let's move on to the songs. Yes. So uh, where do you want to start? So which song do you want to start with? Honestly, I mean, my a personal favorite song on this is I really love Pretend to be Nice, which is the second song on the album. Um, when they finally added this album to Spotify, it was the best day of my whole entire life. And very quickly, it like ruined my Spotify rap for whatever year it was that they <laughs> finally uploaded it. Um, yeah, so I love, I mean, my issue is, is like, I love this whole album so much that like, it's so hard to pick favorites. And I live in a household of f- fans of this film because I make everybody watch it all the time. So there'll be like things that come up that like remind us of a line of any song on this album and we'll just start singing, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, but yeah, I my personal favorite, I would have to say, is Pretend to be Nice for sure. Which quite funny, because I think when um, Anna Sessinger good- passed away there was like sharing kind of like videos and some of these songs saying oh he did this this and this and uh one of the song one of the videos i remember watching i watched the clip of pretend to be nice mm-hmm. um like uh, a couple of years ago when when the first started sharing it rain and stuff and i was like oh actually, this is a really nice song and it was one of those songs that suddenly started that kind of like nestled in the back so uh, so that's that's like the only song that i was kind of aware of before going mm-hmm. into it but it is a it's it's one of the it's one of two with just one writer credit um, yeah um, and that's again i'm stressing it and it's i think it's it's a, just a really good kind of pop punk song yeah and i love you more though that like adam produced multiple songs of this album and get the one song that he has the solo writing credits for Babyface produced so i just like to imagine the two of them having to like sit in a like recording <laughs> studio working on this song together and like what notes they would have passed back and forth and like I just couldn't like it's just one of those things where like when you think about it like as an older music fan and like knowing like Adam Schlesinger's like stamp on music and Babyface's stamp on music and all that sort of stuff of just like I could just imagine Adam being like just make it sound weird (laughs) like just like (laughs) make it sound like you produce it not me (laughs) and I feel like when you listen to it you really do get that vibe where it's like it's a very much like a pop punk song but it also sounds like it could be 
anything else really if you just like changed a couple things which i think is what's really fun about it but yeah i think it's the i I just like i just like how it's straight to the point it sounds like it sounds like it was like on should be like in uh the top like top 10 like punk songs of all time um yeah the and the but the the chorus is quite um I quite like how different the chorus is. So the chorus has that kind of very quiet, rather yeah. sing along, like shout, sing along, shouty kind of blink one eight two. Yeah, like chorus. Yeah, you can really imagine gang vocals going in there, which is yeah. <laughs> the best part. But like it's the uh, the pretend to be nice section, which just has that kind of like very nice kind of whisper, kind of whisper for yeah. going to the ooh 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 ooh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I saw a YouTube video. I think I, I think it was the celebrate the celebrate live thing that we saw earlier where which had Charlie Charlie Bliss come on to sing alongside mm-hmm. Kay Handley and Gladys the Cleo this song. Yeah. And it's it's the, also the song that has the kind of the montage. It's the montage song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is so, great. So yeah, in the film itself there's a, a bit where they start recording and then they suddenly become like the most popular band in um the US. Yeah, yeah, it's like them slowly rising to fame, and then like when the montage ends, you find out the montage was literally like three days long. Yeah, and it's like so funny because you see them like going from like a hundred on the top one hundred list to like number one, and then it's like all that happened in a week. <laughs> like, wait, what? Yeah, it's like yeah, but then like, but you, you see all the CDs get printed out and sold out straight away and i'm like bloody hell that's a really good marketing campaign <laughs> <laughs> to do all that in a few days <laughs> yeah but yeah so but yeah um pretend to be nice i really like that song i thought it was really really good uh where do you want to move on to next um oh god this is always so hard i mean like obviously like three small words is great and that's like the one where I catch like my dad like sometimes just randomly singing it which is like hilarious because like <laughs> it's just one of those things where like I feel like so many pop punk songs the whole thing about them is that they don't like the lyrics don't really make any sense there's like no they like they, I don't know they tell a story but not really and the song's like prom 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 queen brown paper magazine harder than I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> just so like and it's just so funny because this whole song is about like oh like this person that they like like didn't say like told them that they love them too late <laughs> but like you have to really get that from context clues and i'm like what a what an iconic pop punk banger and yeah. then it took like four people to write the song makes it even better <laughs> yeah and again again i think um this has got a really good pop chorus um mm-hmm. which is like which I mean, it's, it's, I mean, on paper, it's kind of like quite cheesy in terms of how it's oh, yeah. constructed, but because it's like not all the numbers count down. So you got like six hard hours, five long days for all your <laughs> lives to come and done. They can't even be asked to fit the number four in. So they use the FOR yeah. version to cover that. Uh, and with three small words and way too late. So the number two is replaced with too late. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, the, the TikTokers really figured out how to use counting down and their song lyrics better than Josie and the Pussycats did. But I think <laughs> I think they started it all, really. It's right. I think it's, it's the song it's the song that opens the film, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And so I, I definitely think that it like had had a lot there. And like, I don't know, I, I just like I love how throughout the whole film, even when they're just using songs in the background, um, it's songs that were created specifically for the film. So even if they don't have like uh, a montage or the band playing in a moment or whatever the case is, like even if it's that's like a scene where like Josie's being chased through an aquarium or whatever the case is, like they still have a song playing in the background that Kay Hanley is singing as Josie. And it's just like, I don't know. I just feel like that's so special because there's so many films that, and like we did an episode about this on Name Three Songs as well about like music supervisors and like how girl culture kind of really shaped the early to mid 2000s in regards to like women's role in helping shape like the interest in music from music supervisory to like blogs and all that fun stuff. Um, and so, I mean, there are so many films that the soundtrack is such an integral part of the movie. But the fact that they were like the soundtrack needs to be such an integral part that we create it from scratch um i think it's just like so iconic because they literally like had essentially created songs and 
like had to fit them into the movie in certain ways and they all fit so perfectly and i'm like this yeah i think um i think is it so there isn't any um non nope only only josie songs and du jour <laughs> yeah because i remember trying i remember i remember trying to catch anything like that on the um in the song credits so i was saying well no it's all kind of all original stuff so uh yeah I yeah think there i are think two there are two covers on the song album but like they Josieified them, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, where do you want to move on to next? Um, I feel like personally, like the other two like big songs that I really, really love are um Shapeshifter and I Wish You Well, which are like two very different songs and take play like are utilized very differently in the film. But yeah, I mean, Shapeshifter is great. I I just like I love songs that are like weird commentaries on like people disappointing you <laughs> and i feel like that's a lot of what it is because it's just it's just like again like again the like i said these like a song like this one i don't need i think was like utilized as like a background song during a scene and yet the lyrics are still commentary on the whole music industry being a fucking mess because the chorus is like shapeshifter guest lister big faker she'll turn around you'll diss her gate crasher rehasher if you think that's cool whatever dude and i just love that so much <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I was trying to. I was trying to figure. So, so this is in the background of something, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Seen it? What? I think that I can't. I think that this might be the one that's in the background of them being chased by fans. But that also could have been "You're a Star." <laughs> I can't remember. I yeah, because the, they took Josie off of HBO Max, so I haven't been able to watch it in the past like two months. I think with this song as well, I remember quite looking it. again. It's. There's a lot of very good choruses in this in this album. Yes, um, but it's that but again, it's that kind of very kind of catchy pop punk, very of that era, uh, early nineties yeah. kind of pop punk. I remember somewhere saying someone saying uh, in an article I read, which didn't I think it might have been it might have been the one off Stereo Gum, um, saying that they was looking for basically a female Blink White too, and yeah, this 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 does feel like it. Could be a Blink One Eight Two song, um, just less whiny. Uh, <laughs> if, well, yeah, if it's Tom, it's less whiny. If it's Mark, just less knob gags. Um, again, just like kind of catching the kind of like I was going to say rhyme scheme, but it's not really rhyming. If it's the same kind of sound at the very end of each, yeah, uh, each letter. But um, yeah, I think uh, I, again another one, another one. I think I, I did. I did mention that I quite liked the album, didn't I? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna move. I can't remember if I said that or not. But um yeah, which which song do you want to move on to next? Um, I think Wish You Well also is definitely a song that could have just been like a solo for like Letters to Cleo, which is Kay Hanley's band. Like that is it's such a good song and I feel like it could stand alone. Like a lot of the songs feel very much like they belong in some sort of movie, but I feel like Wish You Well in and of itself could just be like a really cool kick-ass punk rock single is this the one that alan m is supposed to be singing in that pub or the bar that is um no because i don't remember when this one i was just trying to, i was just searching on youtube to see if there was a scene because i can't remember i feel like it like my brain wanted to say that it was the one that she was listening to like when she, yeah like in the bathtub like when she was supposed to go meet him but i can't remember okay so now, so now he, try, he goes to say that he wrote a song, and which he's like, I write a song about a friend who's in here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was that one, but I say, um, but that character's so memorable, but I couldn't remember if it was a song or not. <laughs> we don't we don't get any Alan M songs. Alan M just exists for plot mo- <laughs> plot points. I mean, if, I mean, if, if as, as, as anyone tried to f- figure out what an Alan M song would sound like. An Alan M song would sound like, um, what the, like, I feel like it would either be like Howie Day (laughs) or like, like one or like Snow Patrol, like one of those sort of like, like kind of sad songs. But you know, that song that's like, if I lay here, if I just lay here, like, I feel like Alan M would sing that song. Yeah. Yeah. Or singing Ed Sheeran covers. (laughs) No, I feel like it's very like early two thousands, like spiky hair boy music. Yeah, 
I was, I was, I was, I was also interested to see, be interested to see what. Or like Gavin DeGraw. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Like something like that. Or Di- is it Daniel Pace who did Bad Day or something like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we talk about DeJour? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about DeJour. I think we should talk about DeJour. I mean, the, I like, I could sit here and talk about this whole album, like, ad nauseum. I think everybody should just listen to it. But I think that talking specifically about DeJour is very important. Um, because <laughs> at the beginning of the film... Other than like starting with like Josie and uh, Val and Mel uh, playing like at the bowling alley, you have a scene in a private jet with this boy band called Dujour, who everybody's obsessed with. And they're like fighting and bickering. And one of the guys in the band uh, finally like goes to talk to their manager and he's like, hey, we were listening to like the unreleased version of our new single. um, And there's something weird going on here. (laughs) And um they're like oh no like alan cummings is like oh no like we'll i'll call like the team at the label like we'll sort it out and he goes to the flight the 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 pilot and he's like take the chevy to the levee or like something from american pie as in to be like okay time to crash this plane with our rock stars on it with our boy band on it whatever um and so they like jump out with parachutes and the band is left to perish um, so you only get to hear like one du jour song in the beginning, which is du jour around the world, I think is the one in the beginning. Wait, let me double check. Because I can't ever remember if if Backdoor Lover is the one we get to start with. Because it's the one that's the this the uh is which is basically the spoof of is it uh back, the Backstreet Boys. Cause yeah. Because it's the one it's because I think you see a clip of video and it's them in an air hanger. Is it Backdoor Lover? Oh, yeah, no. Okay, so the movie does start with Backdoor Lover by DuJour, not Around the World. Um, Even better. So the movie starts off with, like, Matt was saying, like, with a spoof of the Backstreet Boys' I Want It That Way music video of, like, them in the air hangar and, like, fans screaming. And so that will, like, lead on to the whole airplane crashing situation. So you get the iconic bop. That is Backdoor Lover by DuJour. Um, And, again, this is one of those things where, like, you it, it's not in order on the soundtrack like we were talking about at the beginning where like it doesn't start with like the first song in the film and then go to du jour and then it's a Josie and the Pussycats album with kind of like a b-side of here's our record label's other band you should check out du jour <laughs> um and so you get these two du jour songs <laughs> and, uh the fact that nine-year-old me was like dancing around to the soundtrack makes me cringe a little bit <laughs> when it comes to this song yeah, so if I want to briefly talk about Backdoor Lover, because back to- <laughs> <laughs> Backdoor Lover is honestly, like, it truly is so funny because it's a very quintessential boy band sounding song. And then the lyrics are about butt sex. And <laughs> who doesn't love a boy band song about that? Um, and it's just like, it's so funny that this that they have like all these teen girls like screaming and crying over this band and that they're singing this song um and that like this is what's supposed to be taking over the world because the whole thing is that like Josie and the Pussycats are there to like take over the space that Dijor left by perishing supposedly perishing in a plane crash and like it's breaking MTV news like that was the other fun thing about this movie is like there's all these cameos from people who were very like pop culturally relevant So, like, you see the TVs all go to, like, the uh, MTV, like, world news, like, anchor that everybody knew about. And they're like, we have breaking news. Um, The the members of DuJour are presumed dead after a plane crashed into a, like, cornfield in, like, middle of nowhere America. Um, And at that point, like, their career had literally just started. They had just, like, in the film, obviously, like, they had just released a new single, which was, um, I think, supposed to be Around the World Du Jour. But it's, (laughs) like, the two songs are so different. And just, like, the fact that it's just, like, such a joke. And I love even more that this was a song written by... uh, by Deb and Harry because I feel like it very much like has to do with the plot and again just like these ideas of like what really is a boy band and it's very like introspective of like what are they feeding your children like what are they what are what are your kids digesting when they listen to these artists that they that they're supposed to like and it's just really funny yeah those two songs I think are, are great I think some I read somewhere that they liken them to kind of 
Lonely Island before Lonely Island was a mm. thing. Um, but yeah, Backdoor Lover yeah. is hilarious. Um, yeah, just so, uh, <laughs> I mean, the introduction, the first line of the cor- of the chorus is lying on your bed staring up at the moon. And <laughs> 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 I mean, when you think about it, the kind of songs of that ilk, I wonder how many songs perhaps have a bit more nefarious. Oh, so many. So many, like, and really, again, this is a, a theme that we used to talk about, like, in the early days of Name Three Songs, so just, like, the themes of songs and, like, the misunderstandings of what song lyrics were that you grew up listening to and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, like, so funny because this song is so fucking creepy. And <laughs> it's, just, it's just, like, hilarious. Like, I can't, I can't get over it. Like, can you just imagine a song starting with, <laughs> this kind of love is wrong, but it, you know it feels so right. <laughs> Running my hands across your cheeks. They're so smooth. <laughs> Leave the light on, baby, and unlock your back door. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, and then that verse goes, I could be, I'm, I'll be coming through that way tonight to love you for sure. <laughs> oh, dear. Iconic. Icon behavior. <laughs> yeah, and, th- and this is what parents take their nine-year-old children to see. Listen, my mom thought it was for kids. <laughs> But the um, besides it going on to the the jaw around the world, actually, I think if there's a song that's been stuck in my head, it's been this one, which it's not as it's not as triple and tandery as yeah. uh, Back to Lover, but it's so much a kind of trope parody of R and B pop songs at the time. Oh yeah, um, yeah, the jaw around the world is just it's it's basically it's basically about being in the, it's a being in a pop band. Um, yeah like being in the pop band like what the su- success of it means and there's like lots of buzzwords in it and i mean in the like very short screen time that du jour as a boy band has there's also like the thing where they're like nobody really knows what du jour means and so they're like du jour means friendship du jour means brotherhood and there's like this in joke with fans of du jour where like you kind of will ju- or, sorry there's an in joke with fans of like the josie and the pussycats movie where like anything will be like du jour means this so it's like oh du jour means fasten your seatbelts <laughs> and like and it's just like the, this funny thing where the band doesn't even know like what their own name means and yet they have like this song where it's like nobody rocks the mic like du jour <laughs> ride on your motorbike with du jour <laughs> And it's just like so funny yeah but i think also like you're saying it's kind of like a play on the whole idea of being in a famous band being in a boy band and like the idea that boy bands are all like very surface level and all that sort of stuff when the whole point of the film is to like prove that that's not actually what's happening yeah and like i think that the people in charge also think uh, you're kind of disposable and easy replaced which Mm -hmm. unfortunately what some of the music industry (laughs) one thing that i did find as well on youtube is that clearly they had a spare half an hour on set there are two one take videos of uh of the band kind of miming to both of these songs yeah yeah (laughs) and it's all one take so it's basically like oh we've got like an extra five minutes do you want to do this and it's like yeah okay and and the song, the one for this song is hilarious because the Alan Cummings in this Alan Cummings is in it and basically he's just posing along with the the band and stuff with his phone just yeah he's, he's clearly yeah, just that like, was great the bloopers for this film were like on point which they which like since it's an early two thousands movie the blo- the bloopers are playing throughout the end credits and it's just like you could tell how much fun they had on on set for it and like you can tell how much everybody involved in this film really loved being there even just from like how much how willing they are to discuss it when anybody asks them to yeah i think that's one of the um things i kind of picked up from it uh I, there's i think if we, if we leap towards the kind of jump around if we leap towards the the question i usually ask which i don't think is going to apply is usually i say oh have you ever seen this band live but um no. i can't really ask that question because they don't exist <laughs> The closest that's probably happened is I think Kay Hanley's sang a few of the songs with Let's To Clear live a few yeah. times. Yeah, and I, th- I think that there was, like, there was some sort of celebration because, like, the, the album got re-released on vinyl in 2017 and I think that they had, like, some show... They've, ha- they- they've done some showings 
and other stuff. And I'm not sure like what exactly was involved, but yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like something that they probably would have done for the 20th anniversary in 2021 if they could have, but you know, COVID ruins everything. <laughs> yeah. But, I th- but I just say, I think they had like a live thing where I think, um, Rachel Lee Cook for Sorry Dawson and Tara Weed went to yeah speak about the film as well. Um, they've yeah. had they had like Zoom. Um, yeah, 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 they did do Zoom stuff. There was like a bunch of stuff going on. So like they definitely have all like reunited and done some things, and it's just like really cool to see like how it still is a big part of all of their lives in some way or another. Yeah, so like it's one of those where they like kind of they said they kind of enjoyed film like filming it and working on it. Um, joining film and working on it, and that I think it's quite it's quite kind of nice to see them go like want to go back and revisit it a lot of times. Yeah, because I think there's a genuine kind of like love for the film, and I think it's 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 been growing. In, I think it's been growing as a cult. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I mean, there's like there's like a yeah. I mean, th- like I said, there's there's a really cool podcast about it, which. I can't remember the name right now, but I can send you a link later um, where some like Australian fans did a podcast and they got to talk to a lot of people that were involved in the movie, like actors and Harry and Deb, I think, talked to them and like all that fun stuff. And there's the book. And then, yeah, there's just been like a lot of fan resurgence recently and a lot of people kind of, like I said, realizing like how much it really has to do with the industry now and like what we're what we've been dealing with over the past kind of like decade in the music industry um and i i think i joked on it might have been our podcast or it might have been the episode when we talked about this film on the sleepover cinema podcast but i kind of joked about how they how i as my conspiracy theory about why the film bombed was because somebody in the record industry saw it and was like people can't know that we do this shit (laughs) But yeah, so I think in like the reception of the film, it's the reception of the film. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's known as a bomb. They just got they discussed that it was a bomb, but like since then, it has r- done very well. For itself, especially the soundtrack. Yeah, I think the film holds a rating of fifty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it's forty seven out of one hundred on Metacritic, uh, based on twenty nine critics, indicating mixed or average reviews. Uh, Cinema score was a B. These reviews are a hate crime. <laughs> uh, Roger Ebert gave it one and a half out of four, and his words were: "It's just the pussy cats are not dumber than the Spice Girls, but they're as dumb as the Spice Girls, which is dumb enough." Um, which. I don't know. I think if you want to talk about films that age better, uh, Spice World's one. I think Spice World, the film, is one that I think is much more entertaining the older it gets. Yeah, no, definitely. I feel like the Spice World movie and just seeing the Pussycats are like a very good double feature. And I think I've I've mentioned, uh, yeah, this is like the third or fourth episode I've brought up Spice World. Um, But the, uh, yeah, I think that that film's also a very interesting time capsule for 97 in yeah. the UK so uh but yeah but the um but it's raised the cult status of it's raised as it's time it's time it's gone Nathan Rabin at the AV club in 2009 said that it was a fun, funny sly and sweet and a sly sustained spoof of consumerism and it rated it as a secret success with a lot of alliteration with the letter S apparently um the Los Angeles Times wrote in 2017 that the film's sharply satirical vision of the hyper commercial record industry feels only more relevant which is what you was mentioning at the start of the episode it just it feels like it's still it feels like the stuff that you see on the in the film is happening still today yeah oh definitely it's definitely like something that i think is going to be culturally relevant for quite some time and there's a bit there's a bit near the end of the film uh spoilers um <laughs> if <laughs> where uh like the sec- the, the super secret government suits saying oh yeah it's not about music anymore it's about movies and there's a nice and then there's a thing that could flash on the screen saying the Joseph and the Pussycats movie so all so all the secret government uh, mind control stuff is going to go into movies now and I watched that thinking that's record labels talking about TikTok <laughs> if that was made now it would basically, they'll be basically putting super secret 
stuff into TikTok, whatever they're called, videos, reels, whatever. Um, <laughs> unless that's happening now, so uh, I'm just not aware. Well, of it. Probably. But um, yeah, um, and as always, I just want to see if there is a Pitchfork review score on this. And yes, this soundtrack there is. There is, yeah. There was a uh, a, re- a the re-release was. Reviewed oh right, right yeah. Fork, and they gave it a seven point five, which is higher than I was expecting it to be. As they should. Yeah. This is the best <laughs> movie soundtrack other than like Twilight and Oh Brother Where Art Thou. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, that's I think that's higher than Reputation by Taylor Swift. I think they they love to bully Taylor Swift at Pitchfork. So and uh, but uh, not as low as Mika's debut album, which was one point five. Poor Mika, that's mean. Yeah, so that's kind of like the um, the reception uh, reception of that. Okay, yeah, so as I said earlier, there's no live shows. And the other question that I ask is, other albums in the band's discography, but... <laughs> there <laughs> are none! Yeah. Unfortunately, there was not a sequel to the Josie and the Pussycats movie, and they refused to give us a full-length digital album. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I reckon that a full-length digital album will break records. It will break stream. I think it would be the most iconic thing to ever happen, and I want all of the songs to be like questionably gay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the clo- I think the closest we'll, we will probably have gotten to a Does Your album is, as mentioned earlier, um, possibly the Lonely Island. I think it's probably the yeah. closest that we've got to Does Your. Yeah, no, definitely. <clears throat> I think the Lonely Island owes a bit to the kind of kind of like the tr- the tribute tribute into a genre. To uh, the du jour, uh songs, but shame we yeah shame we only got two song two du jour songs. But, I know. Um, yep. Yeah, so uh, very important question now, Sarah. Yes. The song for the playlist. Oh God. For anyone who's not listened to this before, what I'm going to do is ask Sarah to pick one song from this album to be immortalized forever on the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. I can't beat it. I think it has to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did I cut you off too early? Sorry. Um, I can't veto it, so whatever Sarah says goes. So, Sarah, which song do you want to put on to the playlist? Well, if I was going to be evil, I would say you'd have to put Backdoor Lover, but I'm not going to, so I'm going to say that you should put I Wish You Well on there because, like I said, it's an iconic song and can stand alone without this film. I Wish You Well. I mean, as I mean, gearing up to uh, gearing up to episode 100, um, I am... In I've I've been kind of working on my own kind of Hall of Fame playlist in throughout the hundred episodes, so I might spring that. So back to love might end up on that. <laughs> oh my god, you should you should put it on. I think it's I think it's worthy. But yeah. So um, so we're at the end of our conversation, Sarah. So uh, it's been great great to have a chat and um, finally basically getting me to watch this film that I've. Should have been I know it took ago. you long enough. I feel like I'm so I'm so shocked that you hadn't gotten there yet. But yeah, but I think it's again it's kind of like my kind of music anyway. So um, uh, so if people want to find you and your podcast online, where can they find you? Yeah, we're at Name Three Songs on all social media. It's the number three. Uh, I'm queen of TikTok content, <laughs> <laughs> so you can go check out our podcast or at name 3 songscom or my personal social media is Sarah underscore Fagan everywhere. Um, yeah, and I'm always up up to chat about this film, as as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as I think I said, and uh, your car host Jenna came onto the podcast last year to talk about, well, basically me and Jenna fangirled over uh, Wolf Alice's debut album. It's basically, Incredible. Basically, an hour and a half of us just like gushing over it. But yeah, so as I said, then, um, Navy Song is a great, great podcast and uh, one I always learn stuff from. <laughs> it's a learning experience. Listen to that um, and I really recommend it enough. Um, so yeah, definitely do check out Name Three Songs. Um, so yeah, that's it. We've now at the end of our conversation and I was going to say thank you ever so much for. Inter- yeah, thanks hey, so much for having this. me and for finally watching my favorite movie. <laughs> You've been listening to Pick a Disc and I've been your host, Matthew Layden. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash Pick a Disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick a Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. 
Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Do you like crime stories, books, and people talking about those things? Then you should check out the Red and Buried podcast. A murder? A murder. Oh. I'm Frankie. And I'm Sarah. And in each episode, we pick a different theme and surprise and delight each other with a cheeky little review. As you started reading, I was like, this sounds like a romance novel. And then you got to monstrous crime. Yay, there it is. That's what we're here for, isn't it? We're also regularly visited by many talented and best-selling authors, including the likes of Chris Whitaker, Elizabeth Haynes, Emma Stonex, Fiona Cummins, and a whole lot more. I li- obviously listened to the podcast, and I listened to you interviewing Chris Whitaker, and I thought, oh, hey, that sounds like a really good, fun podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if you like your crime books with a big side of silly, this is the podcast for you. Listen to the Red and Buried podcast right now, brought to you by the We Made This Network.